Welcome back to the Original Gangsters podcast. I'm your co-host, Jimmy Bucciolato here, a.k.a. The Doctor, in studio with my intrepid colleague, Scott Bernstein. Hey, now. And Benito is uh, on the ones and twos. Signore back there. Benito Augusto. <laughs> and uh, Roberto's around here somewhere in the studio. He was here earlier. Um, anyhow, uh, thanks for listening. Please uh, follow us on uh, social media. Subscribe to our podcast. Subscribe to our video show. And I just wanted to mention a few things before we get into our hot topic today. If you're new to the show and you're just finding out about us through video, um, we have a lot of audio episodes in our archives that will not necessarily become video. So it's, it's kind of confusing, but the studio that we were at, we did record a lot of episodes and, and you'll notice we're starting to upload those. And obviously all the ones we're doing now are being uh, videoed or recorded rather. But we have some really hot episodes in the past, uh, you know, interviews with guys like Michael Francis and George Young and some really big guests that we just didn't have uh, the capability to video record. But those episodes are available on audio. So don't, um, you know, th don't forget that we have some some really interesting stuff back in the archive. So please check that out. R.I.P. George Young. Yeah, that's Boston right. Yeah, we actually, he was actually in studio and that, yeah. that would have been sweet that was to probably have that video my favorite. recorded. Of all of the guests that we've had in studio, probably my favorite, just because oh, yeah. of how iconic he was, and yeah, and he was probably the toughest interview of a guest I've ever done. Yeah, he was because he was pushing back on a lot of the no, stuff. He was we kind of saying. a prickly guy. Yeah, yeah, but um, we have some pictures of of that when he was in studio on social media. But eventually, we will have some. Um, like video, uh, what would you say, Ben? Like shorts or something from some of those earlier episodes? We'll teasers. Do like, yeah, like teasers. Yep, we'll have uh, some clips, highlights that we'll be putting on uh, Instagram as well as Facebook, especially Gangster Report, that page, and uh, TikTok as well. Yeah, so, so for people that don't know that, that there's a Gangster Report Facebook, I know there's a bit of a disconnect sometimes between the video and the written when it comes to Gangster Report. Uh, Al Prophet handles most of the video until now where we're going to be uploading our own video. But you can find all my written content uh, as well as all the future video content on the Gangster Report Facebook page where we have uh, 330,000 uh, followers. Yeah, so just uh, if you're new to the program, just finding out about us through video, just know that there's there's other content out there, either through our audio episodes on Spotify, or iTunes, or Gangster Report. Um, so anyhow, thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. Uh, we're going to talk about the Hoffa disappearance and some of the recent news going on with um, the, the dig in New Jersey with Jimmy Hoffa. And I think by the time audiences watch this video or listen to this podcast, we ha will have been a few days past the anniversary, right? 40, 47 years of uh, this week that uh, Teamster boss Jimmy Hoffa disappeared into the annals of pop culture. Uh, I, I don't think there's a question that it's the most speculated upon and notorious unsolved uh, murder in American history. And it happened 47 years ago this week. Jimmy Hoffa disappeared from a suburban Detroit restaurant parking lot. And uh, they've been looking for his body ever since. And there was a, what looked to be, uh, at least in a lot of people's eyes, what looked to be a major break in the case that a lot of people were thinking and speculating and predicting was going to be the end of the search for Jimmy Hoffa that they were going to retrieve his body from beneath the Pulaski Skyway in Jersey City, New Jersey. Um, that dig took, took uh, place in, in the last couple of weeks, and we can report now definitively that the FBI did not find anything, and we are now officially back to square one. Yeah, so there, this was a big hullabaloo about this, and, and by the way, another more shameless self-promotion you can listen to an audio cast or um, episode we did with Dan Moldea where he he laid all this out. Like his his the reason why he was supporting Dan this Moldea. theory. And, Sorry, Jimmy. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. The reason why he was supporting this theory and his um, his reporting on that. So I actually want I, I want to break that down for people that are new to this unfolding story. Can you can you give us a synopsis of what was Dan's? reasoning for pushing this narrative and then getting the FBI on board. Why would he consider this a legitimate spot to dig to find his body? So let me first uh, tease out that uh, at the end of this episode, 
we're going to do a, a quick deep dive into what I've coined as the five Jimmy Hoffa fallout murders. Uh, there are five gangland homicides in the in the decade that uh, subsequent the, the subsequent decade after Hoffa disappeared between seventy five and eighty five. There were five murders that were connected to Hoffa's disappearance, and um, we're going to uh, lay those out for you guys uh, at the end of the episode. But starting with Dan Moldea, who has been a mentor of mine, and uh, Dan is been covering the Hoffa disappearance since day one at Ground Zero. Uh, he's written the most about it, uh, besides myself. Uh, he wrote the seminal book, The Hoffa Wars. Yeah, great book. And he's a New York Times bestseller. He's written a ton of uh, really adulated, important, histor historically significant investigative pieces, both uh, in newspapers and magazines, as well as books. Um, we did an episode with him about his book Interference, which oh yeah, uh, that was a fun episode. Shows you the dovetailing between organized crime and the NFL that he that he published in the in the late 1980s, early 1990s. He did one about uh, Ronald Reagan and the mafia. Yeah, uh, he wrote about uh, the Bill. Clinton, I have that book, the Bill Clinton um, White House, and the suspicions around uh, Vince Foster's death. For people that don't know, Vince Foster was a, I believe, an attorney in the White House that was. Allegedly having an affair with Hillary Clinton and uh, committed suicide. There were some people that believed that it wasn't a suicide. Uh, Dan delved into that. Um, but Hoffa RFK has been. RFK is a book about Yeah, RFK. about RFK and, the, and his assassination. So Dan has um, had a storied career. And, you know, we're, we're going to, we, we always tell it like it is here. Uh, Dan put a lot of his reputation and a lot of his life's work. Uh, on the line with this, uh, this theory that uh, he came to uh, with with his reporting and his interviewing of people that were either directly or uh, allegedly directly involved or uh, second, third hand involved in in the Hoffa disappearance, and uh, I think that this all, in terms of where we got, how we got to the Pulaski Skyway in, in, in New Jersey to dig. It, it starts with Dan Maldea developing a source in the 2000s, um, which was 25 years plus after Hoffa vanishes. And Dan develops a source, I believe, in 2007, where he gets a member of the Genovese crime family's New Jersey satellite crew or a, a aging New Jersey mobster by the name of Philip Brother Moscato to confide in him and give him almost a decade, decades worth of on the record comments that I think they, Dan and, and Brother Moscato had agreed wouldn't be released until Brother Moscato passed. So Brother Moscato died in 2014. Uh, it was the 40 year anniversary of Hoffa's disappearance in 2015. And Dan came out with a big article on the anniversary in 15, uh, divulging what brother Moscato had told him, which was that Moscato was responsible for burying Jimmy Hoffa's body. And he told Dan Maldea that the body was at his former trash dump, which was known as the PJP landfill in Jersey city, New Jersey. And uh, that, that property now is a, nature preserve and state park. And uh, over the next handful of years, both Moscato's son and Moscato's partner's son, Paul Coppola, uh, sorry, Paul Coppola, who was brother Moscato's partner in the trash dump, was not a made guy, uh, was just a, a gambler and business associate. And sons of both Moscato and Coppola came forward to both Dan as well as Fox News as well as the FBI to confirm what, well, to allegedly confirm what Brother Moscato had told Dan. And that brought us to last fall where the FBI secured a search warrant and did a initial ground analysis 
of the area back in October of, of 2021. They determined from that ground analysis that there was something underneath, there was disturbed earth uh, underneath the, the ground where Maldea, Moscato, Fox News, Coppola, off, Coppola Offspring took them to. Uh, they waited until the weather got warmer and uh, they dug and they didn't find anything. <laughs> and we, by the way, in previous episodes, we joked about this being Al Capone's vault. Yeah. And for, I'm sorry to do like, uh, <laughs> told you so, <laughs> because, because I like Dan a lot. He's, he's been good to our show and I love his, his, his writings, but I mean, we, I, I mean, is it, he, he, he just, we sort of predicted this. I have we so not? much respect for the guy. And, and again, I, I have a lot of love for him because he's, he's taken a role in mentoring me and, and bringing me into, you know, this, this fraternity of Hoffa experts and researchers. Um, but I've been pretty open with him uh, from, from the start of this, that although I am rooting for him and I want him to be right, and I am open to the belief that his theory has some merit, because it's coming from him. Mm -hmm. But I said, I, I think at the end of the day, you're going to be shown to be misguided in your belief that this was a New Jersey job or that New Jersey was calling shots to the point where they could demand Hoffa's body be sent to them, um, that they would even consider the people that arranged and coordinated and carried out this, you know, the, the mob hit of the century that they would even consider taking a body across state lines and not just one state line, but like four or five state lines and to just to bury him across the country because of a vanity play. I mean, if you believe this theory, <laughs> it was because Tony Provenzano, uh, who was allegedly one of the co-conspirators in, in Hoffa's disappearance and murder, wanted Hoffa's body as a trophy and wanted it as a bargaining chip for potential future prosecutions. And this is under that theory. He sent word to Detroit that he needs off his body sent to him in New Jersey and Detroit just said, okay, here you go, Tony. Yeah. And I just, that doesn't make sense to me in any way, shape or form. It, it flies in the face of traditional mob protocol. It, it flies in the face of just common sense. By the way, Ben might not get the Al Capone's vaults reference. It's before your time. But uh, when we were young, we were little kids. I think <laughs> I was eight or nine. It was a really big deal on national television. Yeah. Geraldo Rivera. You know Geraldo, right? Have you heard of Geraldo? Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, who at the time had his own talk show and was like the, you know, one of the premier investigative oh, yeah, journalists a big deal, yeah. in the world. And back then, you got to remember, there was a lot less oh, media, yeah. to, media to consume. Oh, 100%. Back when, when Jimmy, back in the day, when Jimmy and I first got cable, <laughs> when, when everybody, you know, first got cable in the 80s. Yeah. Cable isn't, wasn't at that point like it is today no, where there's 5,000 <laughs> channels. Right. Back then, cable was like 50 channels. Right. 30 channels. Yeah, if that, yeah. But before that, there was just the three channels. Of course, yeah. Which and I remember. Looks... I remember before we got cable. Sure, sure. Yes, so do I. But at that point, just being on a traditional cable, like not being on NBC, ABC, or CBS, but I think he actually was on a network. I think he was on ABC at one point, yeah. Okay, well, regardless, he was a, it was a, a big deal. They promoted it. Geraldo Rivera had gotten access to Al Capone's vault <laughs> and they thought it was, they were going to find, you know, all this money or gold bodies. or body, someone's <laughs> ear, <Yeah>. their nose. <laughs> and it was a, it, it was on national television on prime time. Yeah. And real live. It yeah, was a live I had broadcast. To, I, my, at that time, my bedtime was like, you know, nine o'clock. And I remember my, asking my dad, I need to stay up for this. I didn't know who Al Capone was yeah. as an eight or nine, 10 year old, but it, yeah. it was cool. To they me. made a big deal. They made such right. a big deal of this that they were going to, Uncover and the they teased. They started at like, and, it was like from ten to eleven, I think. Yeah, or nine to ten. Yeah, it was late. And they teased it all the way to the very last commercial break. Yeah, and then the the end of the show was them going into the vault and finding nothing. Nothing. I think there was like one bottle, an empty bottle that may have been from like Prohibition or something. Oh my god! <laughs> and and where Geraldo's was, career, uh, where, where was where really was the vault? Took a wow. uh, took a hit. The vault was in his old. Hotel headquarters at the Lexington Hotel, which was the place that he uh, had his office at and lived at, I believe. 
um, okay. in the loop. If you're familiar with uh, Chicago, it's, you know, downtown yeah. Chicago. Yeah. I don't think, I'm pretty sure it doesn't exist anymore. I don't know. He also had a headquarters in Cicero at the Hawthorne Hotel. W was that confirmed his vault? Yeah. Okay. And it was just nothing in there. Yeah. It and it was, and even to this day, like for Geraldo, it's like a walking sort of joke. Yeah, it's about a cross him. he has to bear. Yeah. The, and so right from the beginning with this speculation about the Hoffa being in this Jersey dump, I, I kept on comparing it to Al Capone's vault because Dan was making a big deal about it. Fox was making a big deal about it. And I said, you're going to find exactly what Geraldo found. <laughs> I think it's a, I think it's a, I think you can tunnel. Or if you're looking at it from a socioeconomic perspective, I, I think you can lump this into reporters, investigators, researchers that are coming to this outside of Detroit, mm. coming to it from the East Coast. I 100% agree with that. And Dan will fully admit that Dan will tell you if he was on the on the show with us, he would tell us that Dan does not know very much, if anything, about the Detroit Mafia. Right. He defers to you. He'll Dan admit. was an expert on the Provenzano crew. Um, because of his reporting on on Teamsters uh, affairs and, and labor union activity. Right. And that's where uh, Tony Provenzano's, that was his bread and butter. He controlled, uh, he, for all intents and purposes, he controlled the Teamsters union on the East Coast. Oh, yeah. He controlled all the delegates. So yeah, it was a big deal. He had a, he had a voting block there, uh, which was integral to Hoffa to be able to get access to if he wanted to reclaim the union. Um, just to, you know, people that have been consuming us probably know this already, but for anyone that's consuming this for the first time, give you the 30 second, uh, you know, synopsis, Jimmy Hoffa rode to power in the Teamsters Union on the shoulders of the Detroit Mafia, uh, eventually was introduced to the Chicago Mafia, the New York Mafia, the Boston Mafia, and uh, he, came, he became beholden to them. They lifted him into the presidency of the Teamsters Union in turn, Hoffa grew the Teamsters Union into this monolithic international force uh, over a very short period of time, accumulated a lot of power, and then as a reward for putting him into the presidency, he then turned around and opened up the piggy bank, um, the, the central state's pension fund, which was the Teamsters pension fund, which hundreds of millions of dollars of uh, money that mobsters could go and and get access to very low interest loans uh kickbacks that were going to hoffa and, and other teamster administrators and then could go open businesses that they could steal from and the thing that they that most famously built was las vegas all the hotels that were built in las vegas uh starting in the late 50s all came from that pension fund yeah and you could and having you know access to the teamsters also gave the mob opportunities for extortion yeah. right? they could shut down parts of the economy if they wanted yeah. if they didn't get paid uh and then the, give them access not just to the piggy bank but into the corridors of power yes in the labor movement yes which and, is how tony provenzano went from just a typical run-of-the-mill gangster right to a a major power broker in organized yeah, labor. and a wealthy dude but this also gave the the mafia access to right the teamsters especially back then truck drivers you have access to um, distribution systems, which means you could, yeah. you could put on those trucks narcotics. You could put on which they on were those doing, and Hoffa goods. again was taking kickbacks and <laughs> and uh, you have a national distribution system now for narcotics and other things. So, like contraband, any kind of contraband. Yeah. So the, the the stolen goods, the stolen goods. So the pension fund was definitely the golden goose, but but there were other advantages too to this relationship between. The two, and I think it's it's good to remind people that because a lot of people will ask me just you know on the street, well, why, why did they kill him again? And it, it's all going back yeah. to 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 this. So and, he go, he goes know. to prison in 1967. The government, because he was so aligned with the mafia, the government wanted to take down Jimmy Hoffa. If they couldn't take down the mob, they were going to take down the mob's puppet. Yeah, and uh, they busted Hoffa for bribery, jury tampering, and fraud. Uh, went to prison in 1967. And then while he was in prison, was able to arrange a commutation from the Nixon White House uh, or, or a, um, a sentence reduction of some sort. He was supposed to, supposed to do 15 years in prison. He ended up doing five. But in exchange for him able to walk out 10 years early from the sentence, 
in late 71, um, he had to agree to not run for the Teamsters presidency for, I think, 15 years. And which he says he didn't know, but right. you find that difficult to believe. Yeah, I, I think he did know. And then <laughs> once it became public, yeah. he had to put on the face that he didn't know. Right. And uh, he did everything in his power to get that that clause in the commutation reversed. And I believe that he was successful. Uh, my reporting and Dan Moldeo's reporting, which is um, a piece of reporting that has never really gotten a lot of legs, and it surprises me. Uh, that Jimmy Hoffa was a confidential informant for the FBI mm -hmm. uh, at the end of his life. Um, we've had FBI agents on here that will um, push back on that. And the pushback, in my opinion, could be coming from the fact that they just didn't know. I mean, just yeah. because someone's a confidential informant for the Bureau doesn't mean that every agent in the Bureau knows that someone's given information. Remember that also one time we were having... Uh we were sitting down with the former head of the DEA in Detroit. And remember that story he told us that there was an assassination attempt on Hoffa's life. And I think it was FBN back then. FBN agents were at Hoffa's house providing security for like 24 hours. Well, that's an, that's an interesting thing, right? Right. Why wouldn't, why wouldn't Hoffa just have his guy, he had a lot of muscle around right. him. Or the and it just or happens to be the Federal Bureau of <laughs> just, Narcotics? <laughs> just be, because Douglas Valentine, who's another great, you know, another great author who writes about this stuff, he, he's convinced that, that, that Hoffa was probably an FBI informant too, not, yeah. just, not just FBI. So Hoffa comes out of prison in, in, it was the very last week of 1971, for, so for all intents and purposes, 1972. And um, he is intent on and getting back into the union. Uh, the FBI had made him, from my reporting, made him a promise that if he gave up everything he knew about the mob and their influence in the Teamsters and agreed to get rid of the mob in the Teamsters, that they would get that clause in his commutation ruled unconstitutional, and that he'd be allowed to run in the 1976 election. And if he would have ran in the 1976 election, there is no question. He would have won. He would have won in a landslide. Yeah. So... When Hoffa was away in prison, this has turned out to be more than a 30-second synopsis. My fault. I'm just very long-winded. No, that's, that's good. Uh, that's good content. The, um, the mafia had decided that they enjoyed life in the union without Jimmy Hoffa more than they did with Jimmy Hoffa. Uh, Hoffa had been replaced by his, his former right-hand man, second in charge, Frank Fitzsimmons, who was a pushover. Hoffa was a pit bull. Fitzsimmons was a pushover. Uh, and they just preferred dealing with Simmons. And he was more low-key. It Simmons. It wasn't, wasn't drawing the same wasn't media the type, attention. Yeah, didn't love the camera the way that Hoffa loved the right. camera. And uh, they told Jimmy that his days in the union were over with and that he should go retire. And Hoffa didn't uh, <laughs> take kindly to that advice and began making open threats to the mafia on national television, going on shows like 60 Minutes. and. The Tonight Show and the Mike Douglas Show and the um, well, um, Cat, Dick Cavett Show and and saying that I'm going to get back in the union and I'm going to rid the Teamsters of any mob influence. So it just things came to a head uh, in the summer of '75. There were, I mean, there was there was a war going on before, yeah, Hoffa's. Murder. There yeah, was that, a there was a year's worth, and this is where Moldea came yeah, into that's play. His book about Moldea that, right. came uh, into Detroit to cover this union war yeah. that eventually results in Hoffa's disappearance. And it was a war between Hoffa and his loyalists, and Fitzsimmons and his loyalists being backed by the Italians. But believe me, Hoffa had very formidable allies in his fight yeah when he had the rank and file yeah i mean he had the, aver the average teamster member by the way you know in fairness you know the, the average teamster worker i mean they, they're not privy to any of this stuff i mean they they know they you know they're not naive <laughs> they know they know there's some sketchy dudes in the background but they're not privy to all the politics and you know machinations so the average person they they liked hoffa and i agree with you they, they would have voted they would have voted for him 100 percent. they loved him so so hoffa had some strong dudes in his corner, but he also had the rank and file. He had the numbers. Yeah. Which which was 
and, of very concerning to the Jackalones and others. And there was a there was a campaign of violence launched against Hoffa, uh, an intimidation campaign uh, from his former allies in the Teamsters, Fitzsimmons, Roland McMaster, who had been his number one goon for twenty years, was the guy that when anyone when there was any problems in the union and Hoffa wasn't sending the mob, he was sending McMaster, yeah. who was an Irish guy that might as well have been an Italian organized crime figure. He was, yeah. uh, you know, six foot five. Uh, Who's an imposing dude. Very imposing uh, suspect is, in a bunch of murders. Is that the character that's based off the Irishman or no? No, that's, that's, a different that's guy. Frank Sheeran. Okay. Yeah. But I, I would tell, I would tell Ben who is, a, is somewhat of a novice. Uh, Definitely all, nice. All due respect. <laughs> uh, I mean, just in the sense that he doesn't study this the way we right, study right. it, that Roland McMaster was 10 times more of a shot caller when it came to labor movement, Hoffa, mob, than Frank Sheeran oh, ever yeah. was. He was much closer to Hoffa than, yeah. than Sheeran was. So in some ways, Roland McMaster was the real Frank Sheeran. Yeah, I mean, the, the way real, that Frank Sheeran the real, the been, real has yeah. been presented to the public by Scorsese and De Niro probably would have been a better idea to, to frame that around Roland McMaster. That's a good point. But McMaster was assigned to be the captain of this intimidation squad. And a bunch of Jimmy Hoffa's uh, loyalists were either physically attacked or had their property uh, vandalized. Cars were being blown up. Boats were being blown up. Um, and, it, and it just, it, it escalated to the point where Hoffa w was killed. Yeah, so when we talk about the co-conspirators, it it seems like Provenzano was was definitely involved at some level. So, in terms of at a very minor level, though, yeah, I, yeah, but that's that's what I want to get to. So, like, to, to w why put all this stock? Brother Moscato was one of his soldiers. Yeah, Brother Moscato, Tony Provenzano was a capo regime in the Genovese crime family in charge of New Jersey. Underneath Provenzano was Brother Moscato, who was Provenzano's main uh, loan sharking lieutenant. So I have, a I have a difficult time believing that Moscato would be brought into this. I think he's too low ranking to be brought into this conspiracy. Furthermore, what, he, what would be the counter argument? What, what's Dan, I know it's not your position, but what would Dan's counter to my being skeptical that a guy like Moscato would have I mean, brought I think his this? counter would be that. It wasn't anything to do with Moscato other than the fact that he owned a trash I, dump. I see. So he was just a convenient yeah. whatever. He was a made guy. So I, I can be open to believing that Moscato knew something. What I can't be open to believing is that Moscato then turned over the actual burial to his partner in the landfill, Paul Coppola, yeah. who was not a made guy, right? never sworn an oath to, to the mafia, who was just a gambler. And he's the one that's, who's in charge of actually putting Hoffa's body in the, in the ground. I, I don't believe that. And yeah. then he, and then he tells his, his sons who are not made guys. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, let's unpack that a little bit because I think um, if you're, you and I are like really like to get into the uh, minutia of, of organized crime and the sociology of organized crime, the, what I refer to as the political science of organized crime. Um, and, and so I find it difficult to believe because of the way you described it. I think this would be pretty much elites would, would have access to this kind of information. Um, why, why does this go There's against like the protocol and like the, the customs that, that we, we think are, are, traditional mafia ways of doing things. Well, the first thing I'll say is that Tony Provenzano is the most overrated figure in this entire saga. More than Buffalino? I think Buffalino is the most overrated. But <laughs> no, I think Provenzano more than more, Buffalino. More, okay. Because I think Buffalino actually did have to have some type of sign-off. Yeah. And I think Provenzano was merely a pawn. He was a puppet, not the puppeteer. And the perception is that he was some type of puppeteer. Yeah. Um, and then going further down this rabbit hole, I will say that when we're talking about protocol, and this is, you know, protocol in any business, uh, you know, the, the mafia is a business. The mafia is economy. 
They're an organization just like Ford Motor Company is, just like McDonald's. And there's protocol and organization. Yeah, right. And protocol is that— That's why it's called organized crime right. and not <laughs> disorganized crime. So protocol would be whoever Jimmy Hoffa, quote-unquote, belonged to, whoever Jimmy Hoffa was being operated by would be responsible for getting rid of Jimmy Hoffa. It, it, and you can go one step further and say, this, this, is, this is tried and true for, for the mafia from, for time immemorial. If you bring someone in and they turn out to be bad, you're the person that's taking them out. You have to clean it up. Right. Yeah. So Hoffa was a Detroit mafia asset starting back in the 1930s. Um, so he'd been an asset of the Detroit mafia for three to four decades. At the time of his four de four decades, thirty five, roughly thirty five to seventy five, um, so Detroit Mafia was in charge of Jimmy Hoffa. Jimmy Hoffa lived in Detroit. Um, Jimmy Hoffa was liaisoning with all the different mafia families in America via the Detroit Mafia the Toko's really crime family, specifically the Jackaloni brothers. So it only makes sense that once the decision was made, and I do believe there had to be some type of consensus, this was a big enough deal that it wasn't just Detroit deciding to kill Jimmy Hoffa and then going to do it. This, I, I believe that the, the commission in New York, Accardo, Joe Zarelli in Detroit, uh, Buffalino, I, I, because of his role in, in the unions and in, in with the Genovese, um, possibly Bruno, possibly Traficante and Marcelo down south. Um, I think there there did there did have to be some type of uh, communal green light. But after that green light was was okay. Once the, the light was lit, and if you and if you read the available documents from the government, it lays this out in the Hoffax memo mm -hmm. that the Jackaloni brothers. Tony Giacalone and his brother Vito, Billy Jack, were given responsibility, were tasked with organizing, coordinating, and carrying out this murder. They quarterbacked the whole thing. And they were the guys that had been the boots on the ground with Hoffa since, since the 40s. And to your point about Provenzano being a uh, just sort of a uh, chess piece here is Hoffa is not dumb. He knows that things are hot. He's not just going to meet with the Jackalones willy nilly for for coffee. the 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 bait is Tony Pro. That's, that was that was the value that Provenzano brought <laughs> right. to this conspiracy. Right. right. Uh, again, for for people that don't know, Provenzano and Hoffa had been very close friends and allies. Hoffa had actually put Provenzano into power in the union. Mm -hmm. They were in prison together in the late 1960s, and they had a very, very acrimonious fallout where they were physically attacking each other whenever they saw each other, threatening to kill each other's families. <laughs> I mean, it was very, no, very visceral. Uh, and it all stems from insurance benefits yeah. that uh, Hoffa was still receiving and his family was still receiving in prison that Provenzano's family was not. Right. And Provenzano took issue with it, and Hoffa said, "Well, it's people like you that put me here, put me in here in the first place. <laughs> right. So I'll get my benefits, and you won't get yours, and you'll shut your mouth about it." Yeah, which Tony Pro didn't. Right. <laughs> take so by the time Hoffa is out of prison, him and Provenzano are uh, at each other's throats, literally and figuratively. And by the time the election starts coming around, Hoffa realizes that if he's going to achieve his dream of reclaiming the union, that he has to make nice right. with Provenzano Politi because he needs Provenzano's voting block. Right. Uh, he had all the East Coast delegates. So it's too, when the, when the Jackalones say, we can arrange a sit down with Tony Pro, it's too good for Hoffa to pass up. Even though he's alert and he's, he knows that, like, you know, this is no joke, it's, it, he can't pass that up. And we should point out that, again, talking about protocol, Provenzano, under normal circumstances, would never travel to Detroit for a sit-down. No. Um, 
but it made sense and it was easy to uh, weave into the ruse or the lie uh, that Provenzano was coming in that week for a wedding, which he was. Um, but the wedding was later in the week and it was the Buffalino wedding. Um, the, the, the attorney, not the gangster. And uh, William Buffalino's daughter was being married. And the wedding, I believe, was on Saturday. But they told Tony Jacqueline, hey, listen, Pro's coming in town. He's going to come in a day or two early to have this sit down with you. And that was easy for Hoffa to believe because he knew that the Buffalino wedding was that week. Well, sure. And it would make sense that Provenzano was coming into town. Of course. Yeah. That, that, it's, per it's perfect, really. Um, in a, you know. And the Jackaloni is thinking about it from a murder perspective. The Jackaloni spent a lot of time teeing this whole thing up. Uh, again, if you read the Hoffax memo, you will see a series of meetings that were taking place between Billy and Tony Jackaloni traveling to Hoffa. Again, it's, I know there's it's some minutia that might not catch everyone's eyes, but if you, if you know what to look for, there's significance in it. Um, under normal circumstances, Hoffa would travel to the Jackalones. Of course. Or they would meet in a, uh, somewhere in between. Neutral. A neutral site. But in this case, all throughout July of 75, Billy and Tony were going up to Jimmy Hoffa's summer cottage. And there were, I think, three, three separate meetings that took place. The last one being on July 26th. Yeah. And he disappeared on July 30th. And let's get into the uh, forensics of it, too, in terms of why you and I were always skeptical that he would be uh, you taken to New Jersey. First of all, we think, as you pointed out, Detroit is uh, carrying out this operation. Let's get into the forensics. And this is just straight criminology here, I think. Like, why would you drive across state lines the body of the most sought-after per missing person, right? I mean, there is... It, it was on F the news by that night. By that night, <laughs> right. it was yeah. on the it was on the national news. So you have FBI, you have state police, and all these places. You have local PD, like just you know everybody's but looking so, for this. Just so people guy. understand, this wasn't like he disappeared and then like five days later it's oh, in the yeah. news. No, no, he no. was such a big deal of a person. I mean, he was. Right. I've said it a lot that he was like a de facto head of state. He was one for of the most sure. recognizable people on this planet. Yeah, and by the time he didn't come home at five o'clock that afternoon. The news stations were camped out at the Hoffa house by 10 o'clock that night. Right. So wouldn't you, if you have, if you've just carried out this execution and you have access to crematoria, is that the plural for crematorium? <laughs> crematorium, whatever. You had, four, you had at least four, at least four incinerators or crematoriums. Right. Either funeral homes, sanitation, sanitation places. Companies. Wouldn't you just incinerate the evidence? Or would you keep the body on ice and then drive across to the Jersey? Well, let me also say, I, let's ask, let's ask Ben. I mean, Ben, like you're, you're like just as a you know regular dude. I mean, what, what does that strike you as plausible that you would drive the body across state lines rather than just incinerate the evidence right then? That's insane to me. Cross country, you, not just across. It's not yeah. like they brought him to Indiana or Ohio, <laughs> right? Right, several states. Like with the Spilato brothers. Uh, it, it, the, the Joe Pesci from Casino, when they yeah. show you that they murdered him at, at the end of that movie, which was happened in real life, they murdered him in Chicago and they buried him in Indiana. Yeah, which is right but across. Indiana, you, yeah, can, yeah. you can get from where they killed right. him in Chicago to where they buried him in Indiana in 20 minutes. Yeah. Here, this would be a 12, 13 hour yeah. trip. Yeah, at least 12 hours. Yeah, at least 10 hours. to 12 hours, I would say. I mean, why would you. On a well, truck, on a, I think a car you can get there in nine, ten hours, but yeah, on a truck? Not a big-ass truck. Yeah, good point. With a stinking body. Yeah. <laughs> that yeah, everybody's looking no. for. That everyone's, that looking, everyone's for? looking for. High profile. And you're talking about an organization, the mafia, that uh, is known for getting rid of bodies. Yeah. Yeah. And a, and a Detroit, in a smart way. And a, and in a a Detroit smart way. family, which was an outlier in, in, in the sense that they got rid of bodies and never got caught. Yeah. Every other crime family has had members of the crime family arrested, convicted, sent to prison for mob murders. De in Detroit, we're going on almost 100 years. No. Nobody's ever been arrested or convicted or sent to prison for murder. No, the uh, in my book, I talk about some of the, the trials in the 19-teens, the 1920s, 1930s, 
And there were some trials, but no one was ever convicted of those murders. Not not one not one person. So you have like the elite of the elite when it comes to mob murder handling this. It, it don't make it any more complicated than it needs to be, right? And and, I'm, <laughs> right. and I I think I said this on Fox News when I went on this past weekend. If let's just play the game for a second and say that Tony Provenzano did have that stance and he sent word to Detroit I need Hoffa's body for a trophy bring it down here right now you know the response from Joe Zarelli Jack Toko and Tony Giacalone who were the three most powerful people in the family at that time would have been yeah go fuck yourself Tony Pro yeah he can't make that call he can't make that call even if that's what he wanted he can't make that call and so I'm curious to hear what Scott and Ben you know so why are guys like Dan and other people um just have this blind spot about the things we're talking about. My hypothesis has always been there's an East Coast bias on the part of researchers and journalists, and I think Scott uh, uh, subscribes to that too. So what do you guys think about that? Do you think that's part of the explanation of why there's this, like, refusal to think that there's no way Detroit could have carried this out yeah, we were and gotten rid of the body? Detroit, some Mickey Mouse operation. <laughs> right. We need to send in the big guns. Right, right. And it's like, no, these Detroit guys have been – They've been consuming this bullshit for all intents and purposes, or for, for 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 lack of a better term, they've been consuming these narratives, especially over the last five ten years with the development of of oh, the uh, of the Irishman. And, and and I've talked to them; they're offended. Yeah, they take it as a slap in the face. You think we needed some other family to come in and handle our house cleaning? Like you don't think we could do that ourselves? Yeah, and I, I do. I think there's an East Coast bias. I think when when journalists and others think of mafia, they think of New York, they think of Chicago, they think of East Coast, and it's just, it's unimaginable to them that that this rinky-dink crime organization, that's the way they view it, this yeah. rinky-dink this wasn't- crime organization in the Midwest. Yeah. Can, this, because, because, you know, we, we see like... Uh, we, that we're, pygmy thing in New Jersey. You know, and, 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 <laughs> glorified crew. And you, you correct me if, if, if I'm wrong, you, you correct me, but I, I believe that you had a conversation with Sammy the Bull one time. Yeah. And Sammy the Bull, he's, he's a Detroit Mafia, and Sammy the Bull is like, there's a Mafia in Detroit. Like, he know he wow. knew there was, but he was being like kind of No, the first time... Like, the first, you, <laughs> first time I, something like oh, that? I should say the first time. I was... Uh, I've only talked to him a couple of times. Uh, so it's not like I talked to the guy a lot. But the first time I talked to Sammy the Bull on the phone, I, I, I said, I'm, I'm from Detroit. I studied the Detroit Mafia. Um, did you guys have any, did the Gambinos, did you and Gotti have any uh, interaction with the Detroit guys? And he stopped and he paused and he said, Detroit, Michigan. Is that even in the United States of America? <laughs> <laughs> that, that's like a typical of like East Coast mob guys. Although we know that Tony, there was there was yeah uh, Tony the Bull. We know that in, when he was in prison with Gotti, Gotti wanted to meet with the Bull, Corrado, yeah. and Corrado wouldn't meet with them because they had some kind of beef. And, so and, and they, they, they share and Gotti and Jackaloni shared an attorney, Bruce Cutler. Yeah, yeah, right. Who was Gotti's you know favorite attorney was almost a de facto member of the Gambino crime family. In fact. He got yeah, kicked he got, off the last he, case of Gotti's because he was. And wasn't he disbarred? He might have been and then got his license back. Yeah, but uh, they didn't. They didn't let Cutler defend Gotti on his last trial because they said there was too much. Yeah, uh, meshing. Yeah. of the mob and and, and Cutler's yeah, offer. They said he was like Tom Hagen. Yeah, and and we know that if you and, go but back Tony farther, ja- Tony Jacoloni was using Cutler at the end of his life. Yeah, uh, when he was facing a racketeering case that he died before seeing a jury. But Bruce Cutler was Tony Jack's attorney. Yes, and if you go back farther, guys like like Joe Profacci and Joe Bonanno were really close with with Zerilli. and so we. And even if you want to go way back to my book, like you know Gaspar Milazzo and some of the Detroit Joe guys. The boss were, well, he was from you know New York, but originally. But um, and Joe the Boss was was close with Chester Lamare, Cesare Lamare. But anyhow, but but that sort of attitude, it's not just with with certain mobsters. I think it's with with journalists and others that like. Detroit is rinky dink. You can't. Uh, Let's you, not forget you know. that Joe Zerilli sat on the commission. Yeah. Joe Zerilli was on the commission. Not only was he on the commission, Joe Zerilli was the, the, the conciliary of the commission. If you read Joe Bonanno's book, he yeah. says it wasn't an official title, but in Bonanno's book, he says that we had Joe Zerilli in Detroit. When there was any disputes amongst the New York bosses and we needed some type of mediator, we'd always call Joe Zerillion. 
Yeah, him and Bruno, they consider they liked those guys because they felt like they were non biased. You know, we're talking about Roberto just walked in. We're talking about the uh, Hoffa disappearance and and the East Coast bias. We feel there's an East Coast bias that this refusal to accept the idea that Detroit would carry this out, that they would incinerate the body, thinking that they took Hoffa somewhere, they they buried him in New Jersey. That we just find that that's. It it doesn't make sense, and why do people keep on thinking that, this? That's the sexy thing to think. Yes, you know what I mean. It's not the fact that it was done so simply in Detroit and, and, by and, a by a boring crime yeah. family. And yeah, you know, I mean, I studied the Detroit mafia for for a living. To the to the naked eye, they're a very boring crime family. They do everything uh, under a veneer of legitimacy. They're they're make. Uh, money, not headlines. You they don't have internal wars. They, 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 have they shun wars. the media at every possible turn. Yeah, the the exact is, opposite. If it wasn't in Detroit, they would have just put them in a glass case. Yeah. And they would have... <laughs> the exact opposite of the way things are in New York. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And and so um, I just, um, I don't know why. And and it's funny when, when Scott talks to these people and he explains, if you watch Scott on Fox News or whatever, and he, and he explains to them that I think the body was incinerated. You could just tell the posture of the of the broadcaster. And I'm not trying to throw shade on anyone. There's always this disappointment. You could just tell. You could just. It's just emanating off of them. This disappointment. It's like a balloon they're losing always, its air. Yeah, they're always like, oh, like you mean, really? Like, like really? No, they asked me three times. So you think there's a chance that even though the FBI was here last week and they dug and they didn't find anything, you think there's a chance they dug in the wrong place? No, I do not think there's a chance they dug in the wrong. It's not place. even that hard, right? To, I, you know. I, my father passed away. I, I I got his ashes in my house right now. It's not yeah. a big deal. Like it, it, it's not a big deal that you know. Yeah, you yeah to incinerate a body, especially when you have access to sanitation and and funeral homes, and also just get rid of the evidence. Yeah, and right? and we should say that central sanitation, which was one of those trash uh, sanitation companies that had a uh, incinerator inside it, uh, burned to the ground in an arson fire less than a year later. Yeah. Before the, uh, even though the FBI had actually been to Central Sanitation and had been uh, led around to do some type of very cursory look see, yeah. they never got a warrant to get in there. Yeah. But I, I was misreporting, I think, that they had never looked at it. They, they, had, got, they had gotten in there in the fall of 75, but, but it burned down, I believe, in February of 76. And by the way, more shameless self-promotion, like with some of our older episodes. So Scott has these underworld contacts, but also we've had people from federal law enforcement who are investigating this, this disappearance in real time. We've had Mike Cerrone on from the FBI. We Greg Stasekul. Keith, Keith Corbett. Greg was, State School. Yeah, Greg, it was FBI. We had Keith Corbett from, was a former uh, U.S. attorney, U.S. attorney, federal prosecutor. And they have all said, gone on record on our show, that this was a Detroit, even Keith Corbett was sort of offended. He was from yeah. the law enforcement. He, he even said in this studio, well, he's in New York. remember. Keith Corbett's he, a New yeah, Yorker he, that spent his whole career in Detroit. He goes, when they said, do you think, Robbie, I think, or Roberto asked if, if uh, the, uh, the Irishman would have brought in here. Keith Corbett was, well, you don't think Detroit, we don't, you don't think we've got our own guys? You don't right. think they had capable guys that could, that could get rid you of them? You don't think the Jackaloni brothers, Tony and Billy, who the FBI suspects was involved in literally dozens of gangland homicides. I think they, you know, maybe 30, 40 hits uh, yeah. these guys took part in. You, you think they, they had a difficult time getting well, rid of Jimmy Hoffa? talked about this or not, but the only thing that when people ask me about it, the only person that can corroborate Frank Sheeran is Frank Sheeran. Yeah. Well, yeah, there's a, nobody else to say. Or, or Russell Buffalino. There's no one else to say that Frank Sheeran is even a person yeah. or was around or was. I, uh, I heard, and I think I've said this before on the, on the, on the podcast. You're, you're but maybe either I taking his word or you're not. That's that. There's a line in the he's, sand. He's there. mentioned in one of those congressional investigations. Yeah, as that's a, as his a, name was on that list. Yeah, that, but I as heard a from two, labor racketeer. two FBI agents, current FBI agents, that told me when this, when this movie was coming out to, was it two years ago? roughly two years ago they said we did our own little back checking and he's like this was one guy telling me but he was there was two guys together but I was, one of them was telling me this uh that they're not sure that they could link even one mob murder or any murder to frank sheeran yeah right Nobody and, killed and joey gallo and he's trying to make him <laughs> in the in the movie <laughs> And yeah. in the book, they make him out to be like he's some seasoned <laughs> to the Terminator. Yeah. yeah. And these guys what are like, mean? we don't know if he ever killed anybody. 
Yeah, no, I I agree I I agree with that too. One thing I want to point out before before we and then I know there's something else you want to get to, but one thing that was interesting you were talking to me about off air is that another 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 pro a hole if you'll excuse the pun with oh. with this with this New Jersey theory is that the FBI that they were hip to this right from the beginning that this was a potential site they got for a the body they got a tip uh, in the first couple weeks of the investigation from Tony Provenzano's driver a guy named Little Ralphie Picardo uh, that they had taken him to the dump right and they went and looked uh, I think in November of 75, December 75. Yeah. They didn't find anything then, and they didn't find anything when they went back there uh, 47 years later. Yeah, and and at Dan's position is they dug in the wrong place, correct? So, yeah, so let's uh, to wrap this up, <laughs> Dan Moldea is uh, refusing to uh, raise the white flag. He is saying that he believes that it's possible, if not likely, that the FBI missed it when they were there. And that he has uh, some GPR readouts from his own, uh, his investigative team, which I know they're doing a, um, a show through Ample Entertainment, which is a big Hollywood production company, uh, that they have some type of GPR readouts that show that there was disturbance in an area that the FBI didn't dig at. I mean, it goes back to like, we, you know, it's just crazy how technology has changed everything and the fact that, like, you know, when you watch, like, that Aaron Hernandez documentary, you know what I mean? They, they can see they can that they car. Can, they, they, can, can, they, can, they can go to the dump. They can see that there's headlights. Everything's on video. Everything's on video. Everything's and, on text. Or, I mean, he's at the gas station. He's at it. But back then, forget about it. And even 10 years even 10 after years that. Ago. Even 10 years nothing. ago. Nothing. Yeah. Yeah, it's, only, you know. it's a lot more difficult to pull something off like that off. So, I mean, and you had a nice response on on Fox. If you want to give your response to the idea that they dug in the wrong place, so I, you know the the search was based on a search warrant signed by a U.S. district judge. You can't just show up at a location and dig wherever you want to dig. <laughs> right, you have to stick blindly. to the parameters of the warrant. So they dug where the warrant told them they could dug. And then I'll conclude, and then we'll, we'll move on to the five Hoffa fallout murders. But I'll conclude by saying, I think this attitude or this notion that maybe they missed it is, I shouldn't say I think, I know, it's very disrespectful to the people in the government that have been chasing this case, just like Dan has, and just like everyone else that's been investigating it, for 50 years. The government has put tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars into this investigation. It is a ginormous embarrassment yeah, for them that they're, 50, they're 47 years down the road and haven't found him. So the belief <laughs> that they would show up at, at a location like this with the type of tip they got with the warrant and not exhaust every potential way to execute that warrant but think about that a, yeah. the, a hundred million got it i don't know it's a hundred million dollar whatever it yeah. is netflix movie is made 200, 200 on one 200 guy's million. shred of tail or you know that only he can corroborate well and that that goes back people to, love it that goes back to the east coast thing i mean there's a lot of people that watch that movie and they think that that's what that's what really happened well if Scor if scorsese and de niro tell it to you you're gonna believe it yeah no right. and that was to me the the real slippery slope when it came to that film. Cause you know, I'm all for Marty Scorsese making great movies cause of he's course. the greatest that's ever lived. And if you're just watching that movie to be entertained uh, uh, from a mob movie, it, it hits it on the head. But if you're consuming that movie or watching that movie or learning well, from that movie yeah, I mean, to, to understand history, yeah. well, you're, you're to be, to be honest too, is that the story of Frank Sheeran is still the same story as like, Henry Hill. You know, it's it's glorified, right? I mean, I, I, don't, well, I, I don't think Henry more, Hill was hundred times really more glorified. Than, was hundred times more glorified than Henry Hill. I mean, yeah. I mean, the only guys I think that the only Scorsese movie that wasn't glorified was Casino. Those guys are really well. Casino, I, mean, I think, well, that's I think we said because Spilatro was a heavy. And, yeah, he was a heavy hitter. Before, so was Lefty. We have said this before on this that Scorsese has been so great at historical accuracy in all of his previous mob movies. And it, it, it seems that there's, I, I have trouble reconciling or, or it seems to be there's a disconnect between his approach 
to this film and then like his approach to Casino, his approach to Goodfellas, which he stuck very close to the facts and things that were that, yeah, that took creative have loved license that book for some reason or that, you know, well, De Niro, I know De Niro was to this day says that this is what happened. What is it called? I hear you paint. House. I hear you paint house. Which by the way, Scott and I talked about this in Roberto years ago, before this was even known about as a movie. I remember asking Scott, like, I've never heard of that. Never heard that expression. I've never heard that expression. They're trying to, they're trying to tell you, you think? they're trying to tell you that's <laughs> an expression that's yeah, used in the mafia. And, and, and Roberto and Scott were like, yeah, I've never heard of that either. Wow. And then, and then we had some of those, we had like, uh, um, you know, Keith Corbett on, and he was like, I'm telling you, no wise guy has ever used, <laughs> has ever used that ex expression. Hmm. Isn't it supposed, it's supposed to be like when you shoot somebody and the, the blood from their brains go on the, the walls of the house that you're painting the house. Mm. I've never heard. Oh, I mean, I, I think that's where I the heard term you fix comes gutters. from. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it could, it could be. So let's, well, <laughs> well, speaking of people getting killed, you wanted to. Yeah, let's finish off. Let's just go go back uh, through. There were five murders that were either directly connected to the Jimmy Hoffa disappearance or potentially connected to the Jimmy Hoffa. Hoffa experience, uh, experience. Oh, like, this, the, like the Jimi Hendrix experience, yes. the Jimmy Hoffa experience. <laughs> That'd uh, be a good name for our band, Ben. I'm trying to get Ben into hardcore music. Yeah. We're going to form a band, <laughs> the Jimmy Hoffa experience. <laughs> Jimmy Ho <laughs> We're going to the Jimi Hendrix experience. We'll give you the Jimmy Hoffa experience. <laughs> so the first one was November 3rd, 1977, and it was a New York mob attorney named Gino Galena who represented uh, some people that were allegedly involved in the Hoffa disappearance. And Galena was cooperating with the FBI and DEA because he had uh, some legal issues hanging over his head that he was trying to get out of. Uh, he was known as a very slick, good-looking, fast-moving attorney that sometimes blurred lines between him and his clients. Kind of reminded me a little bit when I was reading about him of an Italian version of Sean Penn in Carlito's oh, Way, yeah. David Another Klein, great film, yeah. Kleinfeld. Yeah. Uh, so uh, one of the people that, that Galena was feeding information on was Sally Bergulio, who was Tony Provenzano's main hitter, hitman, who was potentially at the uh, Hoffa murder. He was also giving information against uh, Vincent Gigante, Ooh, the, the chin. chin, who at the time was a capo, uh, uh, maybe an acting boss, but eventually would become the most powerful godfather in all of New York. Yeah. Uh, so Galena was killed November 3rd, 1977 with these rumors of cooperation. And then as part of his cooperation, rumors were, were circulating that he had some type of materials that proved where Hoffa was and mm. who killed him. Mm. Maybe tapes or affidavits. Uh, and then he was using them as some type of bargaining chip. Um, he ended up dead uh, going to visit his mother um, after having a date in uh, Chelsea with a uh, secretary of his. So that was the first one. Then a month later, in December of 1977, one of Jimmy Hoffa's closest friends and uh, Teamster Union uh, figures by the name of Otto Wendell. Mm -hmm. That's uh, a big name. Is found dead. In Livingston County, which is, uh, you know, the Ann Arbor, the three main, no, Ann no, Arbor's Washington. No, uh, La La Liv Lan Lansing and Livingston? No, Livingston is like Howell and Heartland oh, yeah, and okay. Brighton. Okay. Um, it's kind of hidden in Metro Detroit. When people yeah, think Metro yeah. Detroit, they think Oakland County, Macomb County, County um, Wayne County. They yeah. don't think Livingston, but Otto Wendell was in Livingston. He was shot to death in his car. Uh, he had been attacked in 1975 as part of that intimidation campaign of trying to rough up Hoffa loyalists to convince Hoffa to be, uh, to, to, to drop out of the election. And he was slated to testify against Vince Maley Ooh. at a trial in, uh, 1978. And he ends up dead. Uh, the, the, the murder was at first ruled a suicide and then, changed officially on the uh, death certificate as a murder. And Vince Maley was a guy who was deep into that whole teamster. So Vince Maley, a, a couple regime in the Detroit crime family, his uncle, Angelo Maley was a longtime underboss. Yeah. He's on the cover of my book, a picture. Of Angelo and Maley. little Vince Maley 
well, and Angela Maley were two of Hoffa's first go-betweens. Yeah. More so Angela. Vince was in college at that point. Uh, Vince was a, was a, uh, went to Notre Dame and was a war hero. Yeah. Uh, was special forces in World War II. The Maley's introduced Hoffa to a lot of those New York guys yeah. at like weddings and things like that. So uh, keep in mind who Vince Maley is as we go through this list. Uh, the following year, March 1978, March 21st, Sally Bugs Bergoglio uh, is killed in front of a Little Italy social club. There were rumors that he was cooperating. Is he the guy with the glasses and the Irishman? Yes. Yeah. Remember the thick... <laughs> that's a, that is a good scene in the, in the movie. The, 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 the most part I like about him in that, in that movie is that, uh, you know, either you recognize this or you don't, is that when De Niro walks through the door of that house... He's putting that linoleum down. Yeah. So that they can easily wrap roll them up, the roll present them up. up and, yeah. uh, oh, and yeah. get rid of it. What is, but what does is, what is Pacino say to him with those glasses? He's like, how do you, can you fucking see with those things? Or, <laughs> what, remember he goes, I can't see a fucking thing. <laughs> <laughs> so Bergoglio, uh, it, according to some early accounts, uh, was the shooter on the Hoffa hit. I, right. I don't think, I think that has been at least by the current investigators, has been dismissed, and they believe it was Tony Palazzolo, a Detroit mob soldier at the time that would parlay his role in the Hoffa murder to great heights in, in the mafia. But uh, there were a lot of people over the years have believed that Sally Bergoglio was there and possibly pulled the trigger um, and that he was about to go in front of a grand jury to tell what he knew, so they got rid of him. Uh, March of 78, so it was two and a half years after Hoffa disappears. Ch Chucky O'Brien would never corroborate anything, right? Right. And we just heard from Jack Goldsmith, by the way, a friend of the program. Yeah, we've had and him on. And we're going to have Jack on uh, another, uh, another time and, and, and maybe deep dive a little bit more of his, uh, his history because not only did he write this great book about Hoffa and his stepfather, Chucky O'Brien, Jack Goldsmith's a professor at Harvard, but by being Chucky O'Brien's stepson, he grew up around the Jackalones. Yeah. So he has some very interesting insight that I don't think we got into in his first interview. No. He just talked about the book. I no. don't remember it because it's been a lot of years since I've done, I've done a lot of research on this, but I don't remember from watching the movie, who is Bobby Holmes? So Bobby Holmes was. Because he said the, the fish was yes, for Bobby the, Holmes. The fish yeah. was for Bobby Holmes. Uh, Bobby Holmes at that time was the vice president of the Detroit Teamsters Union local. Um, and he was a, a Hoffa loyalist and was someone that was relatively popular in, in the union around the country. And the Seattle Teamsters Union sent Bobby Holmes a freshwater salmon that they had caught in Seattle to Detroit, to the Teamsters Union office in Detroit. I don't know if it was a birthday present or whatever. Yeah, I can't remember. But that's what Chucky O'Brien was doing that morning with the car. Uh, the 75 Mercury Marquis that was used to kidnap Hoffa and the only piece of physical evidence that's ever been recovered from the case. They found Hoffa's DNA in the trunk. Uh, he was using that car to deliver the salmon to Bobby Holmes. And Bobby Holmes's house was in Farmington, uh, Michigan. And uh, he took possession of the car in, in St. Clair Shores from Joey Giacalone, Tony's son, drove the fish to Bobby Holmes' house in Farmington and then drove the car back to South Athletic Club where I believe he turned over the car See, I, to the hit team. I mean, from what I know, uh, you know. That's a lot of driving. I know. On. That just seems to me like, like when I was a kid, you know, growing up. There was no 696 back then either. That's a good point. Well, that's what yeah, I mean. That's a lot that of driving. Like, I grew up on the east side in St. Clair Shore. So it wasn't until, you know, I was. 18, 19, 20 years old. If if you if you asked me where Farmington Hills was, I'd be like, Are you out of your that, he that would be Mars? He would have just me. he would have just taken eight mile all the way. That would be yeah. Mars. To he would he would have taken eight mile all the way. You could take yeah. eight I mile. I mean, or if you if, if you'd ask yeah. me like where that house was, or they're saying in the Beaverland house? Yeah. I the mean, Sheeran I, house? That that might as well be uh, That's Northwest Detroit. It's yeah, like uh no. Greenfield and Seven Mile. Yeah, that but was you could have got side. there from Telegraph. So from Yeah, it was right from, it was two mile it was a mile and a half. From East, Marcus off Red Fox, you, you could have taken you go off Telegraph tel yeah, you could have gone the off way. Telegraph but to that's Seven a long Mile. way. Yeah. 
Well, that's why it doesn't make sense. It would have been like a 20 minute drive. Doesn't make sense. As opposed to going to either Carl Licata's house or Lenny Schultz's house, which were both two minute drives. Right. I never, I, I never heard my dad or anybody talk about Farmington Hills or Southfield. Southfield, forget about it. Yeah. But I mean, Franklin Athletic Club, no way. South dude. Athletic Club. But I mean, in, not to be confused with the Franklin. Either but, way. In, but in fairness, like you got to think about the Teamsters are. I mean, they're they're that's very political, so they're all over the place. I mean, they're like for those who are just regular guys, you live on the east side. Yeah, you don't go to Farmington for anything, at least back then. But but for these guys, that that wasn't that. Unusual and if to be and, driving and, and around. And frankly, if you're Chucky O'Brien, this is what you. This is your job. Yeah, you're a lackey. <laughs> you <laughs> yeah, go deliver for, things for the for the Teamsters and for yeah, the mob. No and you don't, and you don't ask questions. No, you don't. No, no, right. He did. How about the fact that Chucky O'Brien didn't have a car? Yeah. What, what kind of? It, it, he was what thirty five years old at that time. <laughs> <laughs> like, how do you not yeah. have a car? Yeah. And why was he, he was, lent that car? That's pretty. Uh, I'll tell you why he was lent that car. He was lent that car because the Jackalones wanted to be able to. The news, the, the Jackalones wanted the news to be able to say Chucky O'Brien had possession of that car that day. Yeah. He, he, he was, he's a, he's a, a sacrificial lamb. Oh, yeah, you Passy. remember the, the walking yeah. around the, the athletic club that day. Hey, how yeah. are you? Tony Good Jackalone, to you never talked to anybody. <laughs> to yeah. You. Tony Jackalone didn't say hi to anybody he didn't know. Good to see you. Yeah. But the afternoon of July 30, 1975, he was doing the rounds of the entire athletic yeah. club, stopping at people's tables, sitting down with them, <laughs> shaking yeah. their hand, clearing kiss, tables, kissing, ba kissing babies <laughs> like he was running for an election. Yeah. <laughs> except for apparently, except for apparently Gunner, he was smitten right. with. <laughs> oh, that's so, uh, <laughs> then let's move to uh, July 30, 1981, <laughs> the six-year anniversary this is the craziest of one Hoffa's me. disappearance, Carl Licata, who is the Detroit mob soldier, L.A. Mafia Prince, his dad was the godfather of the L.A. Mafia, uh, ends up dead at almost the exact same time at about 3 o'clock. Hoffa was most likely killed at about 3 o'clock, uh, July 30th, 1975. A lot of people that believe he was killed at Lakata's house. Lakata then was either killed himself or was killed uh, at 3 o'clock around three o'clock on July 30th, 1981. And um, I don't think it's coincidence. I think Carl Licata's house was used as the, the, the hit house, the place they took Jimmy Hoffa to to be murdered. It was a house that he had been to a number of occasions over the years to meet Tony Giacalone and Billy Giacalone. Uh, it, was a, it was a house that was known to host sit-downs on the west side of Detroit. Most of the mafia back then lived on the east side. And when they would come west, they would need a place to meet because there wasn't a ton of activity. Or I shouldn't say not a ton of activity. There wasn't a, a, as much of a, a physical presence yeah. of where these guys lived. Lakata lived in Bloomfield Township yeah, and had a house that was secluded. It was called the House on the Hill. And um, he was Jack Toko's brother-in-law. I've been told that Lakata had gotten mouthy. And well, that's what I was going to ask you is that after six years, was, the only reason that would happen was because something yes. must of the trust had so, broken. Yeah, I There were rumors so. that he was mistreating Josephine, Josephine Toko, uh, who went by the nickname Babe. I believe she's still alive. Uh, Babe Toko was Jack Toko's sister, Tony Toko's sister, Black Bill Toko's daughter. Um, there were rumors that, that Lakata was mistreating her. Uh, that he got called on the carpet for it by his brother-in-laws, Jack and Tony Toko. Jack Toko at that time, by 81, he's the full-fledged boss. In 75, he's acting boss. And I've heard that Lakata told his brother-in-laws, there's nothing you can do to me because I, I hold the ultimate trump card. I know that you guys killed Hoff at my house, and I'm going to hold that over your head. Ooh. Bad and move, like Alpha did apparently I, in the movie. Yeah, yeah but both bad move on both. And I, be, I believe that the Tokos killed their own brother-in-law, made their sister a widow, made their nieces and nephews uh, live the rest of their lives without a father, to sh to send a message to the rest of the crime family and possibly the rest of the country that oh. anybody that even thinks about whispering a word of this is going to be taken care of, even if it's our own family. A la Michael Corleone, yes. right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, and we, and we <clears> asked uh, 
you know, the FBI about this and they, they, you know, he said, Mike's Ron said he, they thought it was suspicious. And then I said, well, did you guys look into it? And I, I felt his answer was a little, was a little I, I, it wasn't very satisfactory. So that whole thing is a sort of a sketchy situation about. Well, there wasn't <laughs> a ton of uh, investigation. That's what I mean. It wasn't. I have the police report. Right. And, and three pages. And even and even the FBI didn't seem like very interested in that. And I, I think that that's. And I also, curious. I also want to state, we're talking about protocol. If Nick Licata, who was Carl Licata's dad, had died, had not been dead. Nick Licata died in 1974. If Nick Licata was still alive in 1981, there's no way that they killed no, Carl they couldn't. Yeah, they couldn't do that. Although, and my understanding is that Carl Licata was also not very well liked. Um, I mean, the, the yeah, last just, mafiosi just is... A, read about his time in L.A. Yeah. He wasn't very well liked or respected. Right. So, um, I mean, I, it doesn't necessarily mean he was killed for that, but I'm just saying it's kind of an interesting... And Babe Toko was... Footnote the, to this. Babe Toko was at the house when Lakata allegedly shot himself twice in the chest yeah. and then put the gun down, wiped it of fingerprints, <laughs> put it down about 10 feet, 15 feet from where he <laughs> shot yeah. himself, and then, died. and then went and lied on the bed and died. No, yeah. I think that's true. <laughs> uh, and then finally, 1984, August 10th, 1984, Ralph Proctor, who had been a uh, uh, staunch Hoffa loyalist, just like Otto Wendell, had been physically attacked during this intimidation campaign in, in the in the months leading up to Hoffa's disappearance. Uh, Proctor, just like Wendell, had a falling out with Vince Maley, um, related to to Teamsters union activity. Uh, Maley, his his at that point, Maley's tie into the Teamsters was through the the steel hauling industry. He Vince Maley controlled all steel hauling in, in this area. Mm -hmm. And uh, Proctor was having issues with the union over some money that had been lent. Proctor had lent. They wanted to open up another Teamsters local. They didn't have the money for it. So Proctor gave like a $200,000 loan to be paid back. It wasn't being paid back. He was telling the mob, you need to pay me back my money. I'm not going to go quietly without collecting the money they basically told him you're not going to get your money back shut your mouth and proctor started making some threats roland mcmaster another name from the hoffa case shows up at proctor's office a day or two before he's killed and and tells his son to tell your dad to shut his mouth he's upsetting some very dangerous people yeah and then proctor i don't really want to get into who the suspects are because that will take us down a whole other rabbit hole. But I will tell you that the suspects in this murder are still around and are still alleged to be active and yeah. running the Detroit Mafia in 2022. Yeah, it's another good reason not to mention them. Right. <laughs> but not uh, to mention their Ralph names. Proctor <laughs> left his house on August 10th, 1984 to go meet with a couple of these individuals at a Chinese restaurant in Livonia and was killed in his car, was shot at two separate angles. He was in a, I believe he was in the driver's seat and he got shot by someone behind him and he got shot by someone next to him. Yeah. It's very like cinematic. And, uh, Vince Maley was in prison at the time, uh, but had agreed to have an interview him and, and his, uh, son-in-law had agreed to be interviewed by the FBI. And then, I think a couple hours before the interview, they pulled the plug and that murder has never been solved. So those are the five fallout murders. Um, I think we did a pretty good job of, of giving the lay of the land in, in terms of where we stand in the Jimmy Hoffa case right now. Yeah. Well, this was fun. Thanks for uh, listening. Everyone again, please follow us on social media. Please subscribe, please spread the word and we'll bring you more great content. Next week, thank you. Uh, I'm Jimmy Bucciolato. Thank you, Scott Bernstein. Scott Bernstein out. Ben, Roberto. Right See you guys. <laughs> <laughs>